Is it sh okay? Is it yes, the, the, the slides are showing well. Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay, folks, uh, welcome back. <coughs> so now we are going to start some really interesting topic of uh, data flow analysis, and uh, <coughs> um, it's a very um, um, uh, interesting analysis which is used for um, lots and lots of different things. So um, um, I wanted to go back and uh, <coughs> uh, see where we were, um, and from there, <coughs> excuse me, oh, we'll see how this uh, analysis is uh, uh, formulated, <coughs> um, formulated as a problem. And then we'll get into some specific analyses uh, for different types of problems. And um, then <coughs> we'll go for <coughs> um, into more adv <coughs> uh, advanced territories. So basically the um, main um, formulation of this um, analysis is uh, what we call a static analysis. In other words, um, we have the program, uh, which is represented in terms of this uh, flow graph with IR statements and <coughs> so on embedded inside. <coughs> and we have generated this representation and uh, we want to be able to transform this in a um, form which is more efficient for execution, speed of execution. And um, that's the goal of this analysis. Uh, we do not assume here, of course, we know any inputs to the program. So, <laughs> and uh, so we are agnostic to the behavior of uh, the, <laughs> the program at runtime. Um, so we have to assume <coughs> that whatever we transform here, first of all, uh, is safe for all the different executions of um, the dynamic executions that would occur of this program. So for example, um, let's take this uh, simple uh, IR here, and in this particular uh, um, um, IR, we may say that, hey, you know, uh, let's just get, uh, delete this uh, B5, um, block 5 here, and that will improve the execution. Now, we can do so, provided uh, this is valid across all different dynamic executions of the program under different inputs. So, <laughs> we must prove that the branch uh, from B4 to B5 and that particular path uh, is never taken ever uh, <coughs> under any dynamic execution of this, under any input of this to this particular program. If we can show that we can get rid of uh, that branch is not taken and uh, we uh, go back, uh, we don't have to go to B5 and go back to B2, then we can definitely get rid of that particular, uh, uh, which is also forming a loop, by the way, here. Now, again, as I mentioned, this should be self-evident within the program itself without assuming any inputs to it, because any assumption of input means a particular dynamic instance, and that's not what we are focusing on. So this must be uh, provable, or we must be able to assert that is the case, uh, for this program, regardless of uh, knowing any input. So how can that be possible? Uh, so potentially it is possible that, um, <coughs> let's consider some predicate sitting at the end of B4. And if we can somehow show that the predicate will always evaluate to 
go to B6 and will never ever evaluate to B5, then we have a case here for optimizing the program in this particular way. Um, and that's what the static analysis goal is, to be able to assert uh, as precisely as it, we can uh, in a self-contained manner without any assumption of any input to the program, um, if we can do that assertion in a, in a manner, in a very precise manner, then um, um, it allows you to uh, rule and do certain optimizations. Now for that, of course, the assertion has to be precise that it will never go from B4 to B5. Um, if we cannot make that precise assertion, we say that, hey, I don't know, uh, maybe the predicate will evaluate sometimes to go to B5, sometimes to B6. Now that's an imprecise as an, uh, assertion and uh, uh, in under this, we will not be able to do this optimization. Now, <clears throat> um, um, if the more the precision we have, therefore, um, the better it is. Um, if we are unable to make that precise assertion, then we have to be conservative and we have to not do any transformation on the program. So that is called... <coughs> <coughs> so this particular trade-off is called as precision of analysis versus safety of the analysis. What is the safety here? If we cannot somehow looking at the program or uh, analyzing the program for whatever reasons, uh, if we cannot make this assertion that uh, this branch from B4 to B5 is uh, not taken always, uh, then it is better to say be safe and assume that maybe this branch is sometimes taken, maybe this branch is not sometimes taken, and leave it intact, and of course we lose an opportunity for optimization in that case. It may be possible that, you know, in an oracular sense, that when you run this program under all possible inputs, um, dynamically, uh, you may not be ever, you may not ever uh, in any execution see this particular execution pattern that will, uh, that is you may not ever see before going to B5 ever in under all inputs. <clears throat> but does that mean you can remove it? So the answer is no, because if you cannot statically assert it, you cannot remove it, even though it may be reality. And that's the limitation of static analysis, that um, it may not be able to assert, even though it may be reality, that before B5 execution never ever occurs. <coughs> because of the limitations of the analysis, and we'll see those limitations, uh, we may not be able to assert it. And if we cannot assert it, we must leave it intact and be safe than sorry. And that's the basis of uh, program transformation on any optimization for that matter. Um, it, in which case that unless you can really, really assert it, unless you can really prove it, <coughs> um, uh, that is the case. Um, uh, under all possible input conditions, uh, you cannot get rid of uh, certain uh, basic blocks. Uh, you cannot change certain things and uh, rule on certain things. And of course, the next question will be that why is it uh, that the static analysis gets limited in this particular way, uh, even though in a dynamic sense, under any possible execution, uh, this particular uh, branch will be never ever taken. You will be guaranteed that uh, even if you take it out, it will, uh, the program semantics will be so <coughs> sound. But that you will not be able to assert statically. Why is, it, why is this the limitation? Um, and that limitation is uh, something to be very clearly understood. Um, <clears throat> one of the limitations could be that you're not able to um, um, find out the predicates uh, direction uh, because you don't know which variables the predicates binds to. Um, like if there's a pointer involved in this predicate, uh, we don't know what the pointer is pointing to, <clears throat> and therefore we may not even have a value um, uh, that we should incorporate to find out the branch's existence. And therefore uh, we must assume that the pointer points somewhere, and that value could uh, tilt the execution of this branch in a different direction. 
So that may be one reason why we are not able to find out for all possible instances of the predicate uh, what is going to happen because we don't know what the underlying pointer where it points to. <clears throat> that could be one reason. There could be many other kinds of reasons and uh, <coughs> on the <coughs> on the other hand there will be for certain specialized programs uh, maybe certain constant is coming from the top and it is participating in this particular branch and using that particular value we might be able to rule on the outcome of this branch and in such cases um, we will be able to um, say that, that the branch will never ever take place and the constant of course will originate within uh, the program itself typically within the basic block such as B1 which brings the control in and by propagating it and by iterating on it um, <clears throat> uh, we will be able to show that the branch always stays this. By the way this particular optimization which I just mentioned is called a sparse conditional constant propagation uh, which is uh, uh, not possible by regular constant propagation but uh, in, a diff in SSA sense uh, we will find out how we can do this. And so <clears throat> uh, the reason of course uh, why constant propagation in a regular sense will not help is uh, there will be multiple values uh, of a participating predicate variable reach there and uh, if you combine their uh, uh, intrinsic values one will be constant, second is non-constant and um, um, uh, that will create a problem. For example, uh, you can see here uh, in this case just to quickly conclude this discussion uh, you can see that the A is coming here from the top the first time the loop executes uh, B1 comes uh, executes then B2 executes let's say uh, B3 executes and let's say control comes to B4 so definition 3 which is A is equal to U1 is uh, participating in, uh, uh, in this predicate which is uh, let's say A less than 10 is uh, the branch predicate let's say. So the value of A which is participating here is A is equal to U1 but quickly the situation changes as you can see that's not the only value which always participates there. If the branch is taken uh, under that particular condition then we go here and then A gets to A is equal to U2 and um, that value flows in here uh, at B2 and again goes down all the way here so the value of A which participates <coughs> now in that predicate um, could be uh, A is equal to U2. So the first time it participates it's A is equal to U1, the next time it participates it's A is equal to U2. Now can we always say that this particular uh, uh, branch um, points in this particular way in a static sense. Um, if we look at two different participating values uh, when A is equal to let's say some constant and the other one is the, let's say non-constant. <clears throat> so we are not going to be able to say always that the value of A which participates in the predicate will always be a constant and therefore um, we will rule that uh, this value could be changing and because of the value could be changing the predicate could evaluate in two different ways because we cannot statically say that uh, uh, a value is a constant and a less than 10 therefore whether it is always true or not uh, we cannot rule on that and that's where the limitations come <clears throat> but again as I said if we have a more aggressive analysis uh, you can see here that what is really happening is um, <clears throat> a is equal to u1 is coming in here first time it's not that A is equal to U2 is coming in. So A is equal to U1 is coming in and the first time if the predicate if really evaluates and goes away to B6, there is no chance of A to get set back to U2 and therefore uh, this predicate will always evaluate going to B6. So can we prove it? And that is what is ascertained by the sparse conditional constant propagation uh, which is a more advanced analysis uh, than a usual uh, analysis of determining whether A is a constant or not and then using that information. <clears throat> okay, so that uh, gives you a very good uh, stage in terms of uh, the precision and safety. The precision can be improved by doing more and more aggressive and interesting analysis um, <coughs> and the <coughs> 
better the analysis we get, uh, the more precise we are and um, we can do more optimizations. The lesser is the precision, we have to keep safety intact and we just don't do any changes under the assumption that we don't know much about any particular information if we cannot really uh, at com uh, statically uh, evaluate the outcomes and um, uh, prove certain properties, uh, then um, we must assume that uh, the dynamic uh, executions can go in all different different ways and therefore we will not be able to get rid of some branches like B4, B5 branch, etc. So, <coughs> So the analysis is the king here. And so let us see what the analysis is really all about. And this is, as I said, a static analysis. And what we have is uh, this representation. Uh, so what we do is, um, uh, as I was pointing out last time, we want to analyze the properties of this program at a static point in the representation. That is, let's say, what happens to uh, this program after D2? Uh, during all different dynamic executions that could be possible, uh, what is it that we can uh, proclaim or we can assert uh, after D2? That is the question that we asked. Now what we can assert is this, as you look at this program, we can always assert that the value of uh, J is equal to N after D2, and we can always assert that the value of I is equal to M minus 1 after uh, D2. So those are the two properties which we can definitely assert. <clears throat> and how to generate such properties and assumptions with regard to what we want to do um, and how to do it efficiently is the whole point of the static analysis. So what we do is each of the static program points uh, we uh, designate and we reason about them in terms of what happens uh, to them uh, the properties add them rather uh, for all different dynamic executions um, but in a static sense uh, what really we can say is true after D2, what is really true after D3, etc. So if you ask this question of uh, question that hey what which A do I see after D3? We can always assert that we see that A whose value is equal to U1. If you ask the same question what A do we see uh, or what value of A do we see before D4 in B2? Now remember these are two different points. Here is where what we are saying, what values of A we are seeing before D4 in B2. So now you can see that we can see two different values. The first time we come in, we see A is equal to U1. Next time we come in, however, from this branch, uh, B5, um, we see A is equal to U2. So we could say that, hey, either we see A is equal to U1 or we see A is equal to U2, but we don't see any other value. That also we can assert and we can therefore enu enumerate a set of such values and um, uh, therefore make some decisions. So let's say if A is equal to uh, 10, uh, is if UN is equal to 10, and uh, U2 is also equal to 10, then we can say that um, uh, uh, before D4, um, <coughs> since we can see either U1 or U2, we can always uh, say that, uh, and since U1 and U2 is both are equal to 10, uh, we can always say that before D4, uh, we are going to always see A is equal to 10, and therefore A is going to remain a constant throughout this particular uh, execution uh, after uh, D3, uh, you know, all throughout these different uh, points, uh, we can assert that uh, A is going to remain a constant and that value will be 10. Now, what is the impact of this? The impact of this is manifold. If A is being used in some instruction, we can change this A to the 10 and um, generate better code because of uh, add immediates and multiply immediates and and so on. <coughs> Instructions are much um, um, better than adding two random operands 
a plus b or a multiplied by b etc and the second thing is we save on register because now we can fold all this into the instruction we don't have to carry the value of a from uh, d3 into the point of its use or from d6 or d5 into point of its use uh, d6 into point of its use etc so um, <clears throat> So these are multiple implications, and this is called as constant propagation, as I've been always talking about. Uh, so um, we want to find out um, different uh, um, variables, what values they carry out, uh, they carry rather, and um, from where to where they carry values. All this information uh, is useful to us. And um, so we have these static program points defined, uh, which are at, uh, Within a basic block, uh, the static program point is uh, is between all these IR statements before the first statement and the last statement. And uh, typically, what we do is um, we analyze the property of this program at the entrance and exit of each basic block, and then extrapolate that information to in between points. So we are not trying to compute all the information uh, at all the points, but we typically will compute it only at entrance and exit, the entrance being, um, let's say something before D1. Exit means right after D3. And um, we will compute this information of uh, uh, the uh, uh, different variables and their properties. And then if we need information in between, we will try to extrapolate it. Uh, uh, and um, uh, use that for uh, whatever transformations that we want to do. Now, this means that the uh, size of input to the analysis is the number of basic blocks here. Um, and that's much better than uh, trying to analyze it at each um, static program point, uh, which will make it uh, order n, where n is the size of the program. Uh, this is order m, where m is the number of basic blocks, not the size of the program. And typically, there are multiple statements on an average 10 to 15 statements uh, per basic block. So it will cut down the complexity um, by that particular magnitude. Almost all the analyses here are uh, quad, uh, quadratic or cubic. Um, <clears throat> and um, therefore, if we reduce it from order n, which is the size of program, to order m, which is uh, n over 15 or n over 10, then uh, its effect is a uh, thousand fold in terms of the analysis time. And uh, that's pretty significant when you consider pretty large programs. Um, so what are these points again we introduced uh, and um, what really happens to them and how they carry these particular points, uh, values from one to the other uh, is really the most uh, important part of this analysis. So um, asking ourselves some questions, how many points basic blocks uh, B1 to B3 to B5 have here? You can see that B1 has four, B2, B3, B5 has two points, one is before and one is after, and so on. And um, <coughs> the next important uh, question that we have to ask is, um, what exactly is a part? <coughs> <coughs> path between the points. Because the reason is this, as you can imagine here, um, and you've seen this uh, through this example, let us see what happens within a basic block and across basic blocks as far as these points are concerned. So the value starts here, for example, uh, at D1, i is equal to such and such. From there, uh, you can see that the execution proceeds down. Uh, the value goes from there to D2 to D3, and comes at a program point at the end of this particular basic block, this value of i. Now from there, the control goes to b2. And you can see that the value of i, which is uh, m minus 1, persists till this particular point before we go um, uh, to d4. But after this d4, you can see that the value of i, which is originally there, is modified by the right hand side, in this case it is incremented. So a new value resides in i and that's the one which persists from there. So in short, the value travels through a basic block, uh, goes across the basic block by uh, going through the control flow path and uh, reaches certain point. And uh, then at that particular point, if things change to the value, 
a new value is loaded and again the same thing repeats uh, till uh, yet another value is loaded and it changes that. So path is along where the value is um, uh, can potentially go around um, <clears throat> and if there is no path of course the first observation that leads to is uh, if there is a path uh, the value can go there from one place to the other. For example um, um, consider this uh, uh, i is equal to i plus 1 value d4. The question is can this value ever go to d1 program point? The answer to that is no because there is no directed path from d4. From d4 what all we can do? We can go down, we can loop back at b2 or we can go to b3, we can go to d5, d4, b4, <coughs> go to b5, we can again loop back and come back here and uh, go along d6 or go to b6. So this value from d4 can travel along all these different paths but cannot travel to b1 because there is no path to D, b1 and therefore this value will never ever be seen um, in terms of um, uh, at b1. <coughs> so the path, the presence of a path tells us that the value can travel along that particular path. It's just the common um, analogy is in terms of let's say we have heavy trucks which are carrying the goods and we have roads and the trucks can travel only along those roads. They cannot go in some um, other places and wherever this road is able to reach, um, take this truck along, that's where the truck can go. Now can is one, pass of, one part of this um, and that is uh, shown by the path. So what exactly is a path? The path is simple, uh, the path is a sequence such that um, uh, in a given a basic block um, there is a um, um, p1, p2, p3 up to pn such that um, um, uh, pi um, uh, is um, um, followed by pi plus 1 um, where s is a statement and so there are all these lexically organized uh, statements within a basic block or it is that uh, pi is the end of a uh, uh, given basic block and uh, then it's uh, the, the next part is the beginning of the successor basic block. So successor could be of course along the directed edge uh, from one basic block to the other like for example d4 is successor of d3 etc or it could be even uh, cyclic um, in terms of uh, cycle going back there. So, um, so if we uh, try and see this, uh, is there a path from B5 to the beginning of uh, um, uh, B6? You can easily see the answer is yes because we can go down here through the statement again apply the definition of the successor along which we can go here, um, we can go down here um, then we can go down again uh, by following this uh, so across the basic blocks we follow the control flow graph edges within a basic block we follow the lexical order and we keep applying that and if we can find a sequence like this uh, which terminates uh, which starts at b5 and terminates at b6 then we have found a path um, and in this particular case this is the red path which is shown which can go down uh, through all these points and that basically means that uh, it's possible that this particular value um, which is uh, sitting in D6 uh, after that uh, it, it has a path so it can go along that particular path and uh, it can be uh, uh, the truck can go to B6 and uh, so if you see this value um, as uh, A is equal to U2 and uh, if you want to print it in B6 you'll see that particular value. Now can uh, the path enables the carrying of the value but it doesn't guarantee the carrying of the value. So for example in this case we don't have any other uh, redefinition of A along this particular path. So let's say in B4 we had put uh, A is equal to 10 or A is equal to some U3 then you can see that the, although there is a path uh, from B5 to B6, 
it's not that this value which is in D6 will uh, uh, reach this B6. Why? Because the value can go along the path as the control flow execution uh, occurs, but suddenly in this B4, it will get redefined. It will be a new value which will get assigned to this A because of which, although there is a path from B5 all to the base B6, since A has changed, the value in A which is uh, uh, loaded at uh, D6 will not be the one which will be seen at B6. So, of course, if there is no redefinition as in this case, the value itself will be uh, going and be delivered at uh, B6. But um, if there is a path, but if there is a redefinition also in between, uh, which is blocking the carriage of this value, um, then uh, that value will not reach. Now, if there is no path, of course, there is no chance that the, it cannot even be possible that the value will um, uh, will go along this. So, just like um, a truck cannot go along when there is no <coughs> road, <coughs> the value cannot travel in A um, um, when there is no path. Uh, like uh, A is equal to U2, will never ever be able to go to D3, for example, because there is no path. However, even if there is a path, it uh, may or may not be carried all the way along that path. Along that path, if uh, there is a redefinition of a value, uh, the truck is carrying the value, uh, but is, uh, uh, is uh, getting reloaded with the new uh, goods let's say in B4, therefore the original goods are not going to get delivered to B6. And that's basically the point here. And that brings us to the concept of what we call as definitions and uses and uh, how their definitions travel uh, through this um, uh, control flow path uh, towards the uses. <coughs> and uh, this particular analysis that we will be doing is called as reaching definition analysis and is useful finding for finding out which are the definitions such as A is equal to U2, uh, where are they all going, where are they are, um, are reaching uh, their uses of uh, A along um, those paths, uh, which definitions they are bound to. For example, if we in this situation, if we say that something is equal to A here in B4, what A are we talking about here is uh, the question to be answered. And you can see that we'll be talking about two different A's. One will be um, <coughs> A is equal to U1, which is the definition D3. And the second will be A is equal to U2 uh, when it loops back. Those are the two. <coughs> Sorry about this. Uh, those are the two different uh, definitions which will be <coughs> carried to the point of its use. And then once we analyze these, which definitions are being carried to which use, um, then we'll be able to uh, do certain optimizations in the program. And so uh, definition and use is a very important one. Um, that the, this optimization that we are talking about here, uh, constant folding, as you must have already realized, if uh, both the definitions are constant, then we are going to be able to replace them, and that will allow us to do certain optimizations. <coughs> that is also uh, very useful for dead code elimination. Uh, one of the definitions, for example, um, in the program is never reaching any use. So then what's the point of having that definition? Because nobody is using that value anywhere in the program. That can happen. And so that value is dead and we can get rid of it. Um, things like that are uh, possible based on this single analysis and uh, we'll uh, talk more about them. But let's first formally see uh, what exactly is a definition and what is in use. And um, no. we are taking the view of this particular problem in a static program point sense. So we are talking about a definition at a static program point um, and we are giving it certain um, label, let's say. Um, and we are also, of course, talking about the uses um, of uh, um, certain values. 
uh, at again at those static program points and uh, the question is which are the definitions which are coming to those uses and what can we do about it. So here is an IR statement V1 is equal to V2 plus V3. Um, SK is a, uh, is a definition point which is a static definition point for V1 and uh, that's what we'll designate as like uh, shown in the previous examples also D1, D2, D3 and um, the use points of uh, um, the R values here V2 and V3 are the uses of those and we'll find out what those uses of the different variables there at that static pro program point will bind to okay and where this v1 will go from here to deliver the value it carry it is carrying in it and <coughs> which will ori be originating at static program point sk and which are the values which are going to get used at the static program point sk uh, borne by the variables v2 and v3 they are coming from different uh, program points. Okay, so that is the uh, whole goal of this analysis, which is called as a reaching definition analysis. And um, um, uh, for this particular matter, we are going to introduce the um, um, concept of uh, what we call as a kill. And uh, we are also going to call um, of, um, a concept of what we call as a Gen, um, uh, and uh, let us see uh, how these concepts uh, pan out. So um, let's focus on the definition D1, um, and that D1, of course, is designating the definition of X at that static program point. The question is, um, as I mentioned earlier, if there is a path from D1 to a certain other point, there is a possibility that the definition will uh, go from uh, D1 to that point. But if there is no path, obviously there is no possibility at all. Okay, uh, that's one thing to keep it in mind. But even if there is a path, it's no guarantee that the definition will go there to that particular point. So let us see how that may be possible. <clears throat> So a definition D1 of a variable V, uh, you can see um, it's killed um, between two points, P1 and P2. Um, so P1 is the place where the definition originates. P2 is, we are interested in finding out if it uh, reaches there. Um, and the answer to that question is whether this D1 um, uh, reaches uh, P2. Okay, D1 uh, originates at P1, but does it reach P2? That's the question. And it says, the statement says here, that it does not reach P2 if in every path from P1 to P2, there is another definition of V. Very simple um, and straightforward thing. So what is going on is, a variable V is carrying certain value, which originates at D1. And um, um, this is a starting point for um, um, the path P1 to P2 the, on which this value is going to go. And um, the question is, uh, does it reach P2, which is the end of this particular path? You can see that the value will start from D1 nicely, maybe going along a particular path from P1 to P2. Um, but it suddenly is intercepted by another definition of V there. And because of that, the original value is not to be seen at P2. The new value will be seen. Okay. Um, let's then it consider another path from P1 to P2. Even along that path, uh, this value is uh, getting smashed by another definition of V. And so if it happens uh, along every path, then it, along every path, this value is blocked or is killed and therefore it doesn't reach P2 and therefore uh, the original value uh, of V uh, will not be uh, delivered at P2. Again, same analogy like our trucks and roads example. Imagine the trucks start uh, loading some goods at P1 
and uh, there is a really bad uh, you know, protest or something going on, it tries to go along one particular load, it gets blocked. You can't go further from there. Then it tries finding another road. Can it go via there? Say, no, you cannot go. That's also blocked. And if this happens along all the roads which are there on, in the path, um, then, uh, you know, um, the original value which is going to, which was supposed to be delivered, uh, is not delivered because uh, it's blocked along all the paths, are blocked along all the roads. And that's exactly what is going on here. So now let us see if we can um, apply this um, uh, particular condition um, and um, uh, along to this particular example. Now let's first uh, do a reverse of that. So when can we say uh, that a particular definition can reach a particular program point? Um, so the exactly uh, reverse predicate of this is uh, what is the reach? So a definition di reaches program point j, pj, okay, um, if there exists a path from the definition of uh, origination of the definition to pj, first of all, if there is no path, there is no possibility of reaching, that's what this says, uh, but if there is a path, there is a possibility of this particular definition going along that path uh, and being de <coughs> delivered. But the second condition is, along this path, DI is not killed along this particular path. So what it means is uh, we are able to find a sequence of basic blocks in which we are not reassigning this definition to another new definition, uh, at least along some path. And um, if we are able to do so, the definition is, reaching. If we are able to kill it along every path in between, then we are back to the <coughs> first case of kill. The definition will not reach. So what is reaching means? Reaching means one is able to find at least one path along which it is able to proceed further. There is no redefinition of that variable along that path and therefore it keeps going on and on and on along that path and <coughs> therefore it reach, <coughs> excuse me, reaches this P2. <coughs> so if we apply this, um, which definition reaches where, let us see what happens to, to these definitions uh, which are being shown here. So consider this blue point first and um, um, we have to find out what definition reaches um, blue point, uh, blue dot over here. Okay, so we have two definitions, D1 and D2. So first question that we asked is, uh, is there a path from a definition point to the P2? What is P2 here? Or P2 here is of course this blue point currently. So is there a path from our definition point to this the answer to that is for D1, yes, there is a path because it's just the next statement in the basic block. Uh, how about D2? Is there a path here? You can see that the answer is no because from D2, we just go back and loop here. We can go back to this red dot, but there's no way to reach this blue dot. There's no path from D2 to blue dot. Okay, so there is no way, therefore, since there is no path, there's no way for D2 to reach a red dot. However, D1 can reach because there is a path. Now, it doesn't mean it will definitely reach. Now, let's uh, see the second condition. In order for a definition to reach, first of all, there should be a path. Second is, it should not get killed along that path or at least one path. So along this D1 where it originates to this blue point, we don't face any other definition of x which will have overwritten its value um, and changed it from where it starts and therefore the d1 does reach here in this particular case uh, to the blue point therefore only d1 reaches agreed <clears throat> now let's consider d2 uh, sorry the um, um, red dot 
and see what happens there. Now, as far as the red dot is concerned, again, we apply the same conditions. Is there a path first? If there is no path, there is no way it can reach. If uh, um, um, there is a path, however, we must also not only just find a path, but a path along which it is not killed. And then we, we can proclaim that the definition reaches. So applying this, is there a path from D1 to red dot? The answer is yes, because we can go to the basic block. We can take this edge. It's not within the same basic block, but there is a path which will go along the control flow edge. Now doing the same thing uh, to D2, yes, there is also a path in this case um, from D2 to go to the red dot. So potentially both D1 and D2 can reach. The question is, do they reach? They can reach, and after that, the next condition to be checked is, do we have any kill along all the paths, or at least one path they are uh, allowed to just proceed? You can see that um, after D1 starts, it is not redefined, so it reaches red dot. After D2 starts again, it is not redefined, and therefore it reaches the red dot. So in this case, for red dot, both D1 and D2 reach. In case of blue dot, however, only D1 reaches, and those are the answers. So both D1 and D2 reach red dot, uh, but only D1 reaches blue dot, okay? So to summarize, the uh, reachability of a definition has to do with two things. One is there has to be a path. That's a necessary condition. Uh, but it's not sufficient. For sufficiency, it should not get killed along at least one uh, path uh, along which it flows. And uh, that determines whether a definition can reach a particular uh, execution point. So <coughs> before we proceed further, um, are there any questions about this particular concept of reachability of a value? Uh, or a definition from one point to the other. Again, each value is distinguished based, based on where it originates. As you can see here, we're talking about two different values of X here. One is at the point D1, and the second is at the point And um, uh, they allow us to uh, see what happens where. Uh, for blue, for example, um, we can do certain optimization, uh, maybe because it just involves D1. Uh, however, for optimization at uh, the uh, sorry the uh, uh, the red dot, we must consider both D1 and D2, and analyze their combined properties, and that's the goal of this uh, reaching definition analysis, is to find a set of values that must be analyzed together, uh, because they all can reach that particular point. So, are there any questions? Otherwise, we'll uh, move to the. Uh, how to find this information uh, is the next thing. Okay, so I think um, having introduced the concept of uh, the reachability of uh, the definitions, you can see this is, uh, appears to be a little complex affair here because it's all about paths, first of all, they, whether they exist, and second is along that path, whether there exists a path at least, which uh, things are not getting killed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And <coughs> um, this analysis will become um, really complex, because given the way it is shown here, it is all about paths. So can we decompose this analysis in something different way? Can we refactor it um, and um, um, generate the same um, essence in a sense, the same information, but um, uh, can we factor it in uh, another way? Um, because if we don't, and if, if we had to enumerate all the paths, and if we had to then find out if there exists a path for reachability and so on. 
analysis time will become really, really crazy uh, because the number of paths, as you can imagine in a graph, is tremendously high. It's typically um, exponential. Um, and there are path-based analysis uh, where we are to force to go on that route, but not for this particular problem. And fortunately, for not for many data flow problems, we had to undertake that uh, route. So the question is, uh, what can we do here in terms of uh, uh, doing this efficiently? So um, <clears throat> uh, before that, um, it is important to see that um, at source level, the concept of uh, this program point is a vague uh, one, and that's why this IR and all these basic block representation, and uh, that is what gives us uh, much more precision. So for example, uh, consider this. Um, why don't we do this analysis at source level? The answer is the concept of program points at source level is a vague one. So if we have this simple uh, code excerpt on the left side, if predicate guarding this statement S2, and if you want to find out what is going on at P1, uh, really speaking, it is not uh, statically, it appears that there is only one program point here at source level, but at IR level, there are really two different program points. Um, how? Look at this uh, IR representation of this uh, code excerpt. Um, what we have is the predicate P greater than zero, and if the condition is true, then uh, we are going to go and execute the body of if um, in statement S2, and uh, then after that we'll fall through uh, to the next statement S3. However, if it is false, uh, we'll fall through to S3 directly. So the point P1, which is shown on the source level, uh, really translates to, are we talking about after we take the true side of the branch and execute S2, is that the blue point we are talking about? Or are we talking about the red point? That it is false and we simply go, and we are now at a point uh, right before S3. And those are completely distinguished by the IR representation. And the answer to that, what x is reaching, um, uh, value of x is reaching uh, at blue point and what values of x might be reaching at the red points are totally different. For example, in blue point in this case, uh, S2 is uh, the definition which is at S2 is the one which is reaching. Um, that's the only one which is reaching. However, the one at red, you can see the definition in x is equal to exp1 or x is equal to x plus 1. Both of them are reaching, and so um, uh, the set of definitions reaching right before S3 at the red points are 2, whereas the set of definitions which reach right after S2 at blue point is only 1. And so if you, depending on what optimization you're doing, and how you are considering these values, uh, at red dot, you have to account for both values of x, whereas blue dot, you have to account for only one value of x, which is coming out of S2. So that's why this notion is very, very precise, and uh, that's why we do this analysis. Now, back to the original question, are we going to have to enumerate paths, and then, um, find out this property of uh, some values not being um, killed along certain paths, etc. Or can we do some clever formulation? And the answer to that is, thankfully, in this case, we can do a clever formulation, which is at the basic block level. I'll skip this example, which is also illustrating the same uh, concept here. But going back to our original problem here in terms of um, these um, origination of values and uh, which definitions they carry and so on, uh, we see that what is really going on here is, let's focus now inside a basic block. And uh, for that particular matter, we'll go back to this uh, example here. Let's consider on this example. Now, <clears throat> very carefully focusing on basic block B2, for example. Let us see what is going on here. 
So whole bunch of values are somehow able to reach, let's say, basic blocks entrance. Let's start with some assumption. Let's assume that we somehow know a whole bunch of values which are able to reach basic block B1's entrance. <clears throat> Knowing that, can we find out the set of values which can reach or which can persist through basic block B2? That's the first question to be addressed. The second question to be addressed is, um, are there any additional values which are originating in B2 which can reach its end, which were not reaching its beginning. Now the last question that I asked, are there any additional values which are reaching the end of a basic block, which did not in fact originally come in at the entrance of this basic block? That is easy to answer. You can see that this D4 value, I is equal to I plus one, um, is originating inside B2 and um, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, reaching the end of this B2 um, uh, which may not have even come in the beginning, okay? Regardless of whether it has come in the beginning or not, it is since it is originating and after its origination, it is not really killed uh, within uh, B2, it is definitely reaching the end of it. So the values which are originating uh, in the basic block, a given basic block, and after their origination, which are not killed because there is no redefinition of those values in the basic block, definitely reach the end of this basic block. So that is called as one set of values. Again, uh, they originate in the basic block. They have a definition point in the basic block. And after their definition, uh, the control flows all the way down to the end of the basic block. And in between this interval, uh, nobody reassigns any values to them. So those values are called as loop or, uh, the basic block originating values, and they will always reach the end of the basic block. They'll always be, um, uh, because there is a path which is a linear path, and since there is no redefinition along that particular path, uh, they are not getting killed and therefore they will reach, okay? So we'll collect all these values as the uh, loop, uh, the block originating values which reach the end of the basic block. Now, what about those values which are originating but which are redefined later in the block? They will not reach because they are again killed, but the value which is in the latest um, in the basic block, which is after which if it is defined, uh, which will not get killed uh, is the one which will reach. So let's assume that maybe there are um, in basic block B2, there are let's say five definitions of I. The one which is in the um, latest, which is at us to the end of the basic block is the one which will reach. Everybody in will get killed uh, because of redefinition. They will not reach, but the one which is at towards the end will reach. So these are called as downward exposed generated values in a basic block. How do we know? Very simple algorithm. We will start scanning from the bottom of the basic block backwards. And if whenever a value is encountered there as a definition point, we'll include it in the generated set. And if it is encountered first time, then only we'll um, include it. Uh, after that, if it is encountered second time, etc., as we go towards the entrance of the block, uh, we'll of course ignore them. And uh, we'll collect all these values, and this is called as the set of values which are generated or downward exposed values of the basic block. It's also called as the gen set of the basic block. They always reach the end of the basic block. Now, <clears throat> Let us consider a value which has somehow come inside the basic block at its entrance. Uh, in this particular case of B2, again, it's a good example. Uh, let's say that this J uh, somehow has uh, reached uh, this particular point. It will reach, as you can see here, uh, because there is a path um, and uh, it has not been uh, killed along that particular path. 
so J would uh, reach here at the beginning of the uh, B2. The question is, will this J definition or D5 persist at the end of the basic block? The answer to that is yes in this case because there is no redefinition of J within B2. So a value has come in here with some J and uh, there's no, nobody which has redefined this J so it will continue to hold whatever its value is and therefore J will be in the um, um, uh, in set of values which are able to reach a basic block. So how do we characterize this? We characterize this as all the values which have come in into the entrance of the basic block, we call this as inset of the basic block values. And um, um, we filter from this those values which have not been killed in the basic block by subtracting those sets of values. So in minus kill uh, gives us the set of values which are persistent throughout the basic block and uh, that is the second part of values which uh, reach the basic block uh, end. The first one is whichever was downward exposed was generated within the basic block they are managed to reach uh, regardless of whether they were in the uh, input side. The second is the ones which are um, which um, have managed to reach the entrance uh, but um, which uh, are not killed. Now what about the ones which have reached the entrance like for example some value of i has reached B, B2's entrance. Will that be able to reach down in uh, the exit of B2? The answer to that is no because i is redefined there by D4 and uh, therefore those values will get killed. So in minus kill is equal to the set of second set of values which are able to reach the exit. So, so far we have two sets, gen set which is downward expose and in minus kill is another set. You may ask me that how do we find this in and how do we find this kill set and so on. So, uh, it's very straightforward. Um, let's start with the kill set. If a value has somehow we assume that a value has reached the entrance of the basic block. The question is whether this particular will survive through the basic block and to decide which ones don't survive we define the kill set. So what we do is we start with the collection of all the definitions which are there in the analysis unit. In this case there will be D1 through D6 and we assume that all of them can result in uh, uh, reaching uh, entrance of a basic block uh, let's say uh, like B2 and then we'll find out which are the definitions which are sitting in that basic block like I's definition is there that's the only one so whatever are the I's definitions um, 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 will in the universal set will remove from there the ones which are going to get killed and therefore um, those values will not be a part of uh, our um, uh, sets here which are reaching. So the kill set is take a universal set of all the definitions of a given variable and uh, put that in the kill set if there is, a, there is a redefinition of that variable in the basic block. So do this for J for example, take all the definitions of J, uh, in this case D2 is there, D5 is there, these two are there, right? And um, if, if we assume that they are all in reaching the entrance, uh, D5 and uh, uh, D2 are there, uh, and there is a redefinition of uh, um, uh, J here, so we'll therefore uh, form the gen set here as um, D5 and uh, D2. That assume that they are reached inside the basic block and uh, assuming they're reached uh, they will of course uh, get killed and that means all J's definitions which are there throughout the analysis unit are to be included in the kill set. Okay now remember that they will uh, some of them like uh, in this case uh, D5 will get added back 
in through the gen set which is perfectly fine and that will be the um, uh, loop uh, the block originating definition which will get added again uh, through the at the exit of the block so again uh, in set which will keep finding um, and we'll talk about that in a minute how to find that uh, but the propagation part through the basic block is assume that some definition is coming in into the inset and see if we uh, allow it to flow through. Uh, if we, it's in the kill set, it, we don't allow it to flow through because that means that definition or definitions uh, will be killed uh, by the redefinition of the same uh, variable in the block. Uh, so that's how we get rid of those from going forward. Um, gen set, which is uh, lower exposed uh, blah, uh, variable names, um, which uh, generate the definitions and send it through. That's the second one. And uh, um, again, as I said, the kill is being used for filtering out uh, whatever is not passing through. So uh, with that, I think uh, we'll generate these uh, sets and uh, then we'll uh, do the propagation of these particular sets. Um, and here is how it will work. So to find the reaching definitions of a given program point, at a given program point, uh, we will um, do this uh, uh, solution on a set by, on a basic block by block basis. And in doing so, we are exactly factoring out all the paths business. Um, because what we are going to do is uh, path is uh, part of it is through basic block part of it is across basic blocks so we have seen how to factor the path through a basic block uh, in terms of uh, uh, refining this information of which flows through which does not flow through which originates into these three things and um, uh, we are going to write these data flow equations which will um, allow us to this filtering information which is what I call as data flow equations um, or constraints. And then we are going to solve it uh, for a given problem, uh, which is the um, control flow graph with the IR. Okay, so here are the sets I've been talking about constantly. <clears throat> Gen is the downward expose in a given basic block. In is the one which is coming into the basic block kill is the one which is killed through the basic block and uh, out is the set of definitions at the end of this basic block. Um, um, <clears throat> these sets um, um, can be formed uh, on the control flow graph or they could be formed even on the um, um, in a slightly different way uh, by following the constructs. Let us first uh, do this on a basis of our control flow graph, and then we'll look at uh, how to do this on a construct um, uh, by construct basis. Um, so if you have this uh, two basic blocks here, very simple, i is equal to zero and i is equal to i plus one, and um, we want to find out the uh, reaching definitions at the exit of uh, loop L. Um, you can easily see here that um, first of all, D1 will come down. Um, it will remain in place in the, those two dots in the beginning of a uh, second basic block. Uh, then it will get killed uh, by i is equal to i plus one. Uh, so it will not persist. The only one which will persist is D2 at the end. And then D2 will go from there and D1 and D2 will um, uh, remain in place in the beginning of that particular uh, uh, loop L, uh, but at the exit, uh, only D2 will come out. Okay. So uh, um, here are the equations. So the definition is um, uh, coming in. Let's focus on L here. Uh, the definition is coming here um, from two ends here, and this is how the things are getting propagated across the basic blocks. Uh, within the basic block, it's very clear that um, at the end of the first basic block, uh, D1 will be the one because it's downward exposed, it's the generated one. Uh, 
there's nothing coming in here because there's no entrance uh, definition to that uh, part. Uh, so nothing is coming in. So uh, the only one which remains uh, error at the persistence is uh, D1. So that part is easy. Now, how do the definitions from two different basic blocks get combined into a given basic block? That's the question which is answered here. Uh, that's very easy to see, um, that if the definition has persisted uh, to the end of a particular basic block, when we take that control edge, uh, the definition will flow along that edge and will go to the next basic block because that is exactly how we were finding the paths. So using that, you can see here that uh, the inset of L now consists of two sets. One is the outset of D1 which consists of D1 itself, and the outset of L, which is the set of definitions which are generated there, um, which will flow back along that back edge there. So those are getting combined into the inset because the definition coming along uh, to, in order for a definition to reach a particular um, uh, point, it must come along by at least one path. Remember that definition, uh, definition of uh, uh, how we saw as reaching definition? There has to be at least one path along which it is not killed. So that is where the union operator at the entrance of uh, the basic block, that if it comes along at least one edge, it reaches that particular program point. And that's why we take a union of all the outsets uh, of the predecessors of a given uh, basic block like L. And along each, if there is the one, some definition coming in, it will get included. So that's why this in of L is equal to D1 union out of L. Gen of L, as you can see easily, is downward exposed, it's D2. Kill of L is D1 because that's the definition which is coming in and which is not allowed to persist because there is a redefinition of I. And of course, therefore, uh, out of L is equal to gen of L uh, union uh, kill of L uh, minus, uh, sorry, in of L minus kill of L. And uh, by solving these equations, as you can see, uh, you will see that D2 will be the, um, the definition, which will be at the out of uh, um, uh, L here. And, um, um, so um, you can see here uh, that uh, uh, in of L will depend on out of L and out of L will depend again on in of L and uh, we'll have to solve this uh, system of equations which are posing these as constraints and uh, propagate uh, the values through them. Uh, in which case what we'll do is we'll start with uh, uh, D1, uh, it will finalize its outset uh, we will uh, um, then be fed to in of L uh, to generate that set, uh, which is just D1. Uh, we'll start with that and um, we will grow um, the out of L um, by propagating the um, uh, uh, in of L now, um, which and um, uh, which uh, is minus kill of L. So, uh, um, the D1 will be taken out there, um, um, which has come in uh, from the in of L, uh, because that is the one which is killed, and that will generate the out of L. And then in of L will stabilize to D1 and uh, um, union with the D2. And uh, after that, no sets will change, and uh, we'll get uh, uh, equations uh, which are satisfied over here. So uh, how do we do this uh, is, uh, is something which uh, is shown through these iterations, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, the first uh, part is we initialize the outsets to null. Um, we start with the insets using the current value of outset and we will keep adding and adding and adding and it will monotonically grow and uh, it will stabilize and solve these uh, equations. Um, and that's why you will get uh, D2 here. Um, um, so this is called as reaching the fixed point of a system of equations. Uh, in this case, the assumption is 
uh, that um, the reaching definitions. Um, there are two for, uh, ways to do this. We'll, um, the outset many times is simply set is equal to gen set because that's the part of it. It uh, it has to be that um, which doesn't change. Uh, that is one way to initialize the outsets. The second one is to out uh, initialize it to null. In this case, they have initialized it to null, but we could have very well done out of L is same as gen of L. <clears throat> so um, this puts us as for our last uh, thing that we will discuss very quickly and then we will re revisit it. So in general, how do we compute uh, these solutions to the data flow equations? Uh, the data flow equations being shown as these kind of relations between in and out sets and so on. Um, they prescribe the relationships um, between uh, in and out sets um, and what we do is we set those relationships up first and then we seed the solutions using uh, the corresponding components such as gen of B1 is known, gen of B1 is also known in terms of its skill set, uh, sorry, the kill of B1 is also known and so on for each set we, um, which is based on all the definitions if they were to come in which will get kill. That's how we set the kill sets. Gen is of course downward exposed sets. We start with that. Um, uh, the um, um, uh, in sets, um, initially we assume them to be null. Uh, the outsets are same as gen sets. That's where we start. And um, um, we then start propagating it. A definition reaches a given basic blocks entrance in a in if it can come along either one of the edges. So we'll use this um, 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 relationship between the outset of a given basic block uh, versus the inset of the successor. So we'll start with this initialization um, and then uh, here are the two relationships which we use. So in order to get a fresh set of um, uh, reaching definitions inside a given basic block B, its inset is union of the outsets of the predecessors. Because remember that if a definition is reached at the end of one of the predecessors, uh, it can come in because it is coming along at least one path. If it can come along multiple paths, that's well and good, but that's not necessary. And that's why union operator. So a definition which has managed to reach um, the predecessor of one of the basic blocks will reach that successor of that particular one, um, uh, of that particular block. And that's why in of P is union of out of P. And then within a block, we are propagating using this. And as a combination, we are covering the uh, path relationship here by um, propagating the information uh, along the basic block for that path and for other paths also which go through that. And that's how we reduce the problem from a path problem to a propagation problem across the basic block. And we will keep propagating this. Uh, the information, the reach set of definitions which will are reaching will keep growing. First, what will happen is the definition will propagate just within a basic block to its outset. From there, it will propagate to its successor by following that edge. Then it may go through the next basic block if it is not killed and so on and so forth. And it will keep going on and on and on till it is killed and it is not propagating any further in a given basic block. And uh, uh, that's how we'll find out uh, definition, uh, how far it is um, reaching or propagating. And if we do this um, procedure, uh, you can see that uh, we'll find a set of definitions which are reaching um, um, at certain all different program points. Uh, one last note, and we'll continue again revisiting this, is uh, each definition is given a position in the bit vector here, D1 through D7. And initially, if uh, something is not reaching a given program point or a set, it's set to zero. If it is there in the outset or some plus, it's, it's set to one for that uh, bit vector position. And then we'll simply iterate on these relations of uh, taking unions of bit vectors and they're taking differences 
to in minus uh, kill and then add a gen which is again a union um, and through this uh, we'll keep iterating till convergence and that's why this is also called as iterative bit vector oriented analysis and uh, we'll stop here today uh, thank you and uh, if you have any questions uh, we'll shift to office hours now and uh, uh, see you later